Also, good evening, Om Shanti, welcome. So, a big question for us for the next three Fridays, tonight and today and next uh, two weeks. How much do we love love? Do you like love or do you love love? Right? Hmm? On adore? On adore? We adore? <laughs> Love is such a beautiful word in many languages, right? In English, it's very sweet. It has only four letters. In French, it is known all around the world. Everybody knows the French word for love. Every language brings its unique fragrance into love. Do French people love the same way as Italian? I think they will argue that not. <laughs> Ultimately, it might be the same, but uh, kind of culturally speaking, it might be different. In some countries, loving the act of love, the, the, the feeling of love has to be wrapped into a very cultural uh, setup. In some places, you don't express love the same way you can express it in another country. And sometimes we even wonder if we can feel love in the same way everywhere. And yet, it is such a powerful, you know, word. But it's such a such a powerful energy, isn't it? Do you feel that in life there is maybe nothing really greater than love? Do you prefer love or happiness? If you have a choice, you can either be in love or in happiness. What do you prefer? It's hard to choose, no? Love. <laughs> Let's start to focus for the next few minutes and I'd like to start a little bit differently tonight and let's meditate together a little bit just to open the door to love all together, right? So I'll invite you to just sit very nicely with love. You may want to close your eyes, you can keep them open. And just try to think of someone in your life for whom you have great love not a romantic love don't pick your boyfriend girlfriend husband or wife just pick someone more neutral that will make you think of love in a way which is not um, romance think of your grandmother or grandfather or someone you love a child a friend uh, someone in relationship to you just think of someone for whom you have great love. And you know this is a love that is permanent. A love that doesn't really shake or diminish. Just reawaken the source of love. We say that love is in the heart, but we know it's not the physical heart. So where does that love come from? And when I think of that person that I love, how is it that by just seeing the face of the person I suddenly feel that love. And just a minute ago, that love wasn't there. But just by thinking about a person, it is as if we are opening the door of the heart and we can experience love. Now let's remember a particular moment we were with that person. Just a specific time. When we remember that at that time there was so much love, pure love. How did that feeling come into the heart?
was it just a connection? Was it really the other person? Who was it that <clears throat> that connection and that relationship with a person just touched something in me and opened the door of the heart? And what if that love was to be always in my heart? What if there was a space in my heart filled with love? But for strange reason, I don't always open the door of my heart. Can I hold on to that experience of love? Even if that person is not in front of me anymore. Can I look at nature and feel that same love? Can I see myself in a mirror and feel that same love, that pure energy. So what is love? Where does it come from? Why is it so important to me? So, does it feel good? Do you feel how we can just awaken a memory, just one? And how by just awakening a memory, a relationship we have with someone, a person we love, how we can just suddenly go back to an experience. And it's strange because unless the person you love just showed up in the next second, that was all in our head, right? Uh, anyone was remembering somebody who even passed away? Yeah? Some do. I was. I was remembering someone who passed away. So they're not even here. The love is still here, isn't it? And we just, you know, cut you off guard from the street and after a whole day and may have been working today, I don't know, so your head was filled with many other things, traffic, dinner, <laughs> children, money, bank, whatever. Imagine if the mind was a little bit more free for a little longer period of time. Imagine that person would just show up in front of you. How much even that experience could even be bigger, isn't it? But it's still in somewhere here. We say here, but really it's here. We say love is in the heart, but now we know the heart is a little bit here, isn't it? <laughs> So, you know, what really amazes me is um, how we can live for so long with so little love. If you look at some very terrible places on earth, some people live at the moment in a war zone. They live in a war zone, isn't it? Every day, for months, for years. How long has the war in Syria been going on for? Six, seven years? That's a long time. Can you imagine waking up every day, not knowing if something will fall on your head, having no grocery store, worry about pure water, you don't even know if you can drink, forget about going shopping, 
forget about pay, paying parking, forget about you know anything. Millions of people on Earth live like that, in refugee camps, in very very, you know, f d limited financial situations. People live in a situation where they are being tortured. Other people torture other people. Uh, people feel some relationships are so painful that their whole life is busy with sorting out how to get out of that uh, problem. So, and of course, we will say, okay, we're fortunate. We have grocery stores, we have parking meters, we have, <laughs> you know, all kind of facilities. We are alive, we have health, financial resources. But how much love do we have? How much time per day can we say that, yeah, there's a vibration of love? And yeah, we might find that we can still live okay without being in that state of love all day long. But I'm surprised to see how much can we live for so long without having more love. And I think in the same way that some people on earth live today, in very difficult condition, but they still live. And they still would say that they find little happiness. In war zone, people still get married, which is incredible. They still have incredible things happening in refugee camps. Children play football. You know, people make love. People do things in refugee camps. So people, I think, today, and some of us, I think we can live what we think is a normal life. But for another person who would live outside of that refugee, of that spiritual refugee camp, another person might look at us and say, how do you survive with so little love? And we'd say, what do you mean? Isn't it? So how do we know how much love would be considered healthy love? Do you know? Two hours per day? <laughs> Three hours per day. You know, we live in fairly comfortable condition, 24 hours per day, really. Anyone here missing, uh, lacking food, being hungry for more than a day or two? Most likely not really. Other people on Earth have barely one meal a day, and they think about it all day. And so we would tell them, wow, how do you survive with so little food? And we would feel it's normal to eat three times a day. So are we in a healthy love affair, in a sense? Or are we not realizing that we're really actually living in spiritual refugee camps with a lack of love? <laughs> I hope I'm not depressing you, right? <laughs> The point is, what if there could be a life with 10 times more love than what we feel today? And it doesn't mean you are getting married tomorrow again and you're going to be <laughs> into you know, the love of your life. That, not that kind of love. So in this session and the next two sessions, what I'd like to propose to you is... Um, yeah, the kind of lecture, workshop, whatever we call it. It's more like I want to propose really an active reflection from your part as well. And the idea is that today we can think of what is love, really in terms of the spiritual element of it versus the non-spiritual element of it. Next week I'd like to talk about love in the relationships and how sometimes relationships really complicate love a lot, and how love gets really funny in relationships. And the third session I'd like to propose this notion of the purest love, the real experience of the purest love, love in its purest form. You know, when you have purified love, <laughs> we want to drink sometimes purified water, isn't it? you like purified water or do you like muddy water? You know, we prefer purified water. If it says this water has been filtered, purified, and it's pure, okay, it's good. What about our love? 
maybe next uh, last session would be purified love when love is in its best shape possible how does it taste like and how healthy it is but first i think it's important to to really think and that's where i'd like to invite you to um reemerge many forms of love you know for me the person that came to my mind uh in the little moment was my grandmother and it's not someone i loved always <laughs> i've always loved my grandmother when she used to give me candies and all kind of things when i was a kid but it took me a long long time to discover and maybe for her to change as well and our relationship to change but the love i felt for my grandmother was not the same when i was younger and the many last years of her life she was such a different person and the love we had and i had for her was uh, enormous very easy to express love when i see her face when i think of her i can remember so many moments spending with her just sitting didn't do much just sitting talking having maybe a cup of tea or something but those moments are very very and more big i think than bigger than visiting uh, the acropolis in uh, athens recently <laughs> if i have a choice i prefer to go for a cup of tea with my grandmother <laughs> than visit you know eiffel tower in paris or acropolis in athens because that love is not in the stone it's not in the building it's not in uh temples you know it's in living form but what is that love and i think that because we had so many different experiences of love some that gave a lot of happiness but some that became sour and gave a lot of sorrow anyone had ever had a heartbreak or how do you call it uh the cœur brisé you know when your heart uh, broken heart when uh, your loved one sends you that little note that you don't want to ever read <laughs> it's over <laughs> oops <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's the note you don't want to receive from your lover, right? But anyone has ever experienced an impossible love, falling in love with someone that you shouldn't be in love with, right? So how many f- times did we experience a love that created a lot of pain? Anyone has never experienced that? We can arrange it if you want, but no. <laughs> I don't know. Love that gave pain. We know it. and love that gives happiness we know it attachment yeah there's attachment as well some will say attachment brings a lot of happiness too and some attachments when they're broken that care creates a lot of pain mm-hmm. if your cake has really stuck to the mold and you're trying to separate them it's a big messy thing <laughs> so some relationships they just don't work as well as a nice muffin coming out of the little thing <laughs> just creates when muffin you know is stuck with the paper and you try to eat and it's crumbled everywhere it just don't like it love we say can be um uh physical and it can be spiritual it can be human it can be divine uh it can be mystical it can be fantasy right love has so many dresses it can appear with rose petals and perfume it can come as so with horns and spears <laughs> and poison depending which movie you're watching it's nice this uh, i saw in a plane now i was flying and the only film that was uh, everybody was watching was uh, beauty and the beast how can you fall in love with a beast which of course will turn into a prince you know you kiss the frog i don't know if it's uh, yeah same in english <laughs> don't kiss a french person but just kiss the frog and it turns into a prince that's such a lovely story isn't it it's a love story a friend of mine one day argued that says you can love you can kiss the frog once twice third time if after three times it doesn't change into a prince just take the frog slam it against the wall maybe it will turn into a prince <laughs> different films different methods <laughs> so
So many films, stories, not just about love. <clears throat> so the uh, experience we try to create in Raj Yoga and spirituality is to try to dissociate love from just the physical happening, to try to capture the spiritual dimension of love, and to recognize that love is actually one of the fundamental energy of the soul. And we know that love could be triggered by someone that you see. They say love at first sight. You know, even blind people have love at first sight, isn't it? It's magical. <laughs> even without sight, you can still fall in love just like that. And it's like fire. You know, when it happens, it's fire. But it's very physical in a way as well. It's really connected to the person, the way they look, the, what you see in the eyes. And there's a physical chemistry that happens, and we know it. And with time, that physical chemistry you know, leaves a little bit more room to relationship, appreciation, values, uh, moments that we share together in life. And as the physical usually tends to age, uh, that becomes less of the pool. And then it becomes more like a, a long-term relationship. And what do really old people say when they are still in love after 70 years? They say, we're well, just like good friends. <laughs> it's not anymore the little lover of the 18 years old or 20 years old uh, boy and girl. You know? it just, so love transforms. And uh, it becomes physical in the beginning, and then it turns into human sometimes. But to move it to a next step, which is more spiritual, that's where you know, meditation, reflection, contemplation, philosophy, mysticism, religion comes in. I selected a beautiful text that probably most of you have heard. I don't know if I can read it in English properly because it's a very old words. And if you look at the translation, there are so many different ways of translating. Uh, it's a letter from the, um, the Bible, I tell you, the New Testament of St. Paul to the um, Corinthian. How do you say in English? Corinthians? I'm sure you all know that letter. Yeah. It's always nice to hear it again. Yeah. So I looked at it and there are many versions. But uh, like this one, because it's the easiest one to read <laughs> with the most modern words. So just to make you reflect and see how for all time, this is like you know, thousands of years old and it's been written a long, long time ago. This has been in the heart of human history. So it's St. Paul and he meets the Corinthian and he says to them, if I speak in human and angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong, a clashing cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and comprehend all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything I own, and if I hand my body over so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love is not pompous. It is not inflated. It is not rude. Love does not seek its own interests. It is not quick-tempered. It doesn't brood over injury. It doesn't rejoice over wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. If there are prophecies, they will be brought to nothing. 
If tongues, they will cease. And if knowledge, it will be brought to nothing. For we know partially, and we prophesy partially. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I used to talk as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. But when I became a man, I put aside childish things. So at present, we see indistinctly as in a mirror, but then face to face. So at present, I know partially, but then I shall know fully, as I am fully known. So faith, hope, love remain, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Isn't that beautiful? First time I came to read this with the awareness of what it's really talked about, because I read it, I'm sure, in my religious studies as a kid and in church, but never never cling to me and it was in a movie <laughs> and in a movie suddenly there was this song that I thought what is this and uh, they translated or they subtitled the song it was in um, uh, um, what's the language of Jesus it was uh, La Marette uh, Aramea Aramea yeah? so they translated it and I copied by hand the subtitle of that song and then I realized yeah, I saw that before, <laughs> and I realized this is not like a made-up little nice poem from a movie. <laughs> Oops, it's from the Bible. <laughs> and then uh, people were laughing at me, saying, "Eric, yeah, right, this is a very famous uh, letter." But this is such a powerful letter. I've been using it for years because I find this is really about you know you can have everything you want, but if you don't have love. Really, you're just like a dry little plum, you know, stone and hard like a stone. You know, this is how the heart will become. Sometime I come back from holidays and uh, not here because someone looked after my plan beautifully, beautifully, but in the office, sometimes you come back after a week or two and you see your plant, you know, three quarter dead. And I say, oops, <laughs> and just give water. And then suddenly you see the magic of the plant, you know, going back to life. I wonder if we were to take a picture of our heart, in which shape will it be really? We may think it's okay, we may say, it's still alive, yeah, it's still alive, <laughs> but barely. How much would our heart look like if it was 100% filled with love? How much love do we have for humanity? If you just sit quietly now and feel the world in front of you, do we have enough love to give to seven billion souls? That's required quite a bit of love, right? If you think of someone you hate or you don't really like, how much does it take to turn around that lack of love into love? They're right there. That's a dead flower in the part of geranium. <laughs> Look at your flower, it's beautiful, but there's a dead one there. Usually you remove it. But the people for whom we don't have love, it's like dead flowers we're holding on to. They say that monkeys are very strange because if their child die, uh, if a child of um, if a little baby monkey dies, apparently the mother will hold on to the corpse for a long time. I think that's what we do sometimes when we hold dead relationships, but we hold on to it with vengeance, with bitterness, with remorse, with, you know, wrong feelings. And we hold on to it our whole life. And then we can say 20 years later, I still don't talk to him. After what he did, I don't talk to him. So that bitterness is still there. And it's actually really poisoning the heart, but we hold on to it. A heart filled with love cannot hold any such feeling. If it's a hundred percent love, then the heart cannot hold on to any of these feelings. Impossible. But 
it has to be filled with spiritual love. So we see that there is physical love, love that is for a man, a woman, a child, or a grandmother, a friend. We identify the love connected to the physical being. But if you were to think of that same being as a soul, how would be the experience of love? Right? If you think, just remember the person you were remembering earlier. But now instead of saying, hello, grandma, see the soul in that grandmother. It's another dimension. That grandmother, unfortunately, is, um, how to say, uh, mortel. She's a uh, mortal, yeah. She, she passes away at some point. We'd love to see our grandmothers eternal, but they go at some point. But think of the grandmother as a soul. And suddenly you say, it doesn't die. Souls don't die. So our grandmothers are still there, but not as a grandmother, just as a grand soul, as a soul. They're still there. So the soul, when we look at the soul, it doesn't look the same as the body. And the effort we try to make in our spiritual journey is to develop that soul-to-soul vision, see the other one as a soul. But to only to be able to see someone as a soul first require that I see myself as a soul and I've learned to experience myself as a soul. You know, if I think of myself as a Canadian, when I meet another Canadian, I feel, oh, hey, how are you doing? Particularly if you're in Syria in the middle of the war and you meet another Canadian, <laughs> yeah, I love you, I love you, <laughs> isn't it? don't know that Canadian. Maybe if that was your neighbor in Canada in time of peace, you would never love that person. But in the time of war, when life is really fragile, you love anything Canadian, you know? Why? <laughs> Security, recognition, that's bodily. We identify with who we think we are. So we feel Canadian, we love Canadian. We feel Quebecer, oh, now we love more Quebecers. But think of someone who is from another country here. Uh, I originally came from France. So when I meet French people in Quebec, what do I do? It's a mix, you know, it's Canadians, French, this. Some people have been, uh, were born in another country, came here at the age of six. But when they're 80 and you tell them, do you still feel a bit from Indonesia or India or somewhere? Yeah, it's still there. And when they see the Indian flag or the Indonesian flag or some other flag, they still feel maybe not 100%, but there's a little part of them that, oh, I like it. And when they see another flag, they feel nothing because they, they don't even know the flag, actually. Right? Sometimes we see flags, we have no idea what this flag, uh, which country it's from. But the flag you represent, you know that flag. And when we see it, whoops, there's a feeling. It's called it body consciousness, we call it, which is reality, it's identification with our physical identity. But is the soul Canadian? Is the soul Vietnamese? No. So it's only because we identify to the body that we feel connection with what is connected to the body. Now, what about the connection with the soul? Normally, when you meet another soul, you should feel, hey, a soul, how are you doing? <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> We're all on earth. It's funny. You're meeting souls on it. If you meet a rock on the sidewalk, you don't say, hello, rock, how are you doing? No. Don't talk to rocks. I mean, I hope you don't do. No. <laughs> you don't talk to rocks. But now we have become ignorant of souls. We, don't, we are like zombies. And if somebody is in pain or somebody, we don't even see, hey, this is a brother soul. If you were on another planet and you meet another human being, it doesn't matter where they're from, China, or Russia, or Indonesia, you don't care. If you're on Mars and you're all by yourself for 50 years, first time you see a human being, he's from Earth, oh, I love you. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Isn't it? So it's just how we connect. It's... Uh, it's just, uh, we we'll make it up. But if we look at the soul and we think of ourselves as a soul, then we can create soul love, which is very beautiful, it's very different. And we 
have to relearn that love because we haven't used it. <clears throat> have you ever said to someone, oh, you're a soul? Oh, I love souls. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so happy to see a soul. <laughs> you know, never we think that way. We always say, where are you from? You know, how old are you? And uh, we go for the physical aspect of it. And only if we know the person for a long time, sometimes we develop a different type of feeling, but it's very physical. So if I look at myself as a soul, think of myself as a soul, experience myself as a soul, what, come, what kind of thoughts come in our head? Very different thoughts. Thoughts like, you know, I'm eternal. Do you ever feel eternal? No? <laughs> If you do gardening, you know, for six, seven hours, do you feel eternal after? No, you feel like, ouch, <laughs> I'm getting old, I can't do this anymore. You know, sometimes we do feel aged. How often do we say, oh, you know, when you celebrate, particularly those who have gone through 30, 40, 50, then you reach 60, I say, oh gosh, this is getting a little, right? Then 70. Does it feel eternal at that time? I'm not sure, right? I don't think it's feel eternal. That's because we just feel the body. But what of the soul? And I shared with many people recently that uh, I suddenly remembered a lot of people that I knew uh, that would be 35 years ago. And at that time, they were 40, right? If we talk physically. At that time, I was 20-something, 20 21. They were 40, and I remember very clearly at that time, thinking of them, they're old. <laughs> Not really, I mean, they were old. <laughs> to me, they were like no interest at all, in the sense of uh, bodily friends. <laughs> it's like, no, these are really old. At the age of retirement age, probably. And they were just 40, younger than I am today. And so I never thought of it too much where at the age of 20, all these people were really old. My mom was old when I was 20. She passed away, she was 40-some years old. And only today I realized my mother was young. We know it intellectually, but actually, now that I'm older than she was, I think, gosh, this was very young, 40 years old. But when you're 20, 40 is very old. And I always felt that these people, they, all, uh, they have always been old in my life. <laughs> Today they are 75, they're still old. But I don't see they have changed that much. They have, they've always been old. And my big realization was that whoever is 20 who is meeting me today probably thinks I'm old. <laughs> and that is very depressing because I think, I don't feel I'm old. <laughs> so it's perspective. I'm gonna, my point is, it's just a perspective. For the mind of a 20 years old person, I'm an old person. But in my head, probably like in yours, I don't feel much different than what I was when I was 20. But suddenly now I'm old when I was young. How does it work? It's body consciousness, because it's not true. And the body is aging, that's it. That's the only part which is really aging is my body. And my mind will age if I think I'm the body. And who will think that they are old is those who keep saying to themselves, I'm getting old. Keep telling yourself you're getting old, you will really feel old. But those who are young in their head keep saying, I don't feel old, I feel the same. No. Those who see themselves as being old will feel old. And those who see themselves as being always young, they will feel young. Some people are physically 60, 70, 80, and they look really older. One day, it was a shock to me to see three person of the same age, and I thought, my goodness, you know, this one at that age looks like that age. The other one, she looks like 30 years older, and the other one looked at least 20 years younger, but they physically had the same age, isn't it? So where does that come from? That's what you think. Some people, after 40 years old, they start complaining about every little thing that is falling apart. I tell them, don't worry, you're becoming an antique. It's so much value on antique. You know, it's very nice to become a statue that has, everybody will carry like this, you know, 
it's breakable. Pay attention. It has a lot of value. It's such an expensive, <laughs> you know, such a beautiful antique. It's good to become an antique, no? Don't hurt my arm. It's about to be broken. <laughs> it's all right. You're an antique. A high value. <laughs> How do we see ourselves? It's all in our head. So if I see myself as a soul, how would I feel? I may start to feel eternal. I may start to feel that as a soul, what I really, really want is pure love, pure happiness, and pure peace. I personally believe that these are the only three you know, values that are at the core of the human soul. Love, peace, happiness. We talk a lot about purity, but actually it's pure love, pure peace, pure happiness. We're really tired of bargained love, cheap love, fake love, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. We're tired of that. We're tired of broken peace, artificial peace, short-term peace, isn't it? And we're tired of illusionary happiness. Um, exciting happiness that leaves you with um, hangover. Is that uh, the expression? <laughs> You're so happy. Then when you wake up to reality, you really have a hangover. You know, This is the kind of happiness people have today. They buy a car and they're so happy, scratch on the car, <gasps> depression. It's what happened. So we don't have true love, true peace, true happiness. So love is a value, is a virtue, is a power. How much do we experience that? Or is it just a fix? For some people, it's just a fix. It's a drug. They want to buzz on love. They want to fall in love. We say in spirituality, you rise in love. In bodily consciousness, you fall in love. Because <laughs> that's what happened. And you're going to hurt yourself. So I think we should celebrate rising in love. That's spiritual, not falling in love. It's much better. Yep. So it's a value, it's a virtue, and it's a power. So value and virtue is one is more like something that you start to measure a value, you know, something that has value, that has um, sort of kind of meaning. It starts to count. It counts for you. So you start to measure it. But then when it becomes pure, it becomes a virtue. And when it accumulates, it becomes a power. So value, virtue, power. And I think, as I shared in the beginning, I invite you to now assess your own love in yourself and see how much do you see love as a value, as a virtue, as a power. Love as a value, uh, in valeur, hein, as a value is like you start to take care of it. You start to look at how can I preserve it so it doesn't get spoiled. And sometimes because we don't recognize it as a value, but we take it for granted or just for something we don't have control over it, we don't value it. Uh, Next week, we'll see that how this is just the beginning of troubles in relationships. We pay attention to the relationship, but we forgot one thing, is that without that value of love, the relationship is not going to work at all. So it's a value. It has value. It's worth something. And that value can increase. Love that you have for someone for the last 60 years has great value. Love that you have for your Pudding, uh, not pudding, uh, Putin, or oh, pudding, whatever. It is. <laughs> the love that you have for your Putin, <laughs> pudding, whatever it is. It's maybe 149 is that the price of a Putin? <laughs> That's the worth of that value. It doesn't, it's not worth a lot, isn't it? Value. But it can remain all our life as just a value. And if it's, um, if it's temporary, it remains a value. And it will go with like the stocks or the market. Today I love you. Tomorrow, I hope to. 
yesterday I didn't like you at all because of what you did. And so value just increased. So every day you wake up and you have to reassess how much you love. And what people ask in a relationship, how much do you love me? And you all have been um, playing with daisies, is it? I love you little. I love you quite a lot. I love you a lot. I love you not at all. <laughs> That's the value of love. Changes. But then when we become spiritual, we make it into a virtue. And we realize that the difference is that when it becomes a virtue, it becomes unconditional. That doesn't matter what you say. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't actually even matter who you are. I see love as a virtue. And I realize that my true nature, my identity, is to be a being with love. So when we make that switch from a value to a virtue, we start to see that love is not something that I feel for someone, but it's something I have in me. And I decide that I'm willing to share it with not someone, but with everyone. In different forms, but with everyone. Does it make sense? The value, virtue. And then power is when I have valued the value of love. I have recognized it as a virtue and used it as a virtue. Then I accumulate it by using it, which is the paradox. And I said, the more you use it, the more it multiplies. Because it's a business. It's, it's an investment. If I invest love in a relationship, that relationship grows. And that gives me power. Because it's a pure love. If it's conditional love, physical love, then I'm not um, using it, really. I'm abusing it. I'm actually using it in a sense I'm consuming it. And that's where relationships are so difficult today, is that we don't inject love, we use love, we consume it. And you really squeeze the relationship until the last drop. And if one day there's no more drop, you say, I don't love you anymore. I used it, I consumed it. It's very different. But in spirituality, when we give love, what do we say? Then you receive love. So it's an investment. If you water a seed, from one seed, it will grow into a tree that will give you a million seeds forever. I mean, at least for a long time. Isn't that amazing? So one drop of love can turn into a tree of love. But it has to be given, not just consumed. If I eat the seed, then Om Shanti, that's over. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> it's very nice. That's what you have for breakfast, right? <laughs> but don't expect it to become a tree of uh, seed in your stomach. It does become nice little energy. So that's what people do now. They eat love. They don't produce it. They don't distribute it. They don't harvest it. So love becomes power when it's being used. And then we find it becomes an, an accumulation. Think of people, I mean, I was raised as a Catholic and I still have um, the feeling that um, Jesus for me has always been a very, very inspiring figure. And I remember really honestly being uh, at Easter, that's usually the time when we see all this film, the same movie, you know, <laughs> for the last uh, 50 years, I think they're still showing the same movie. Uh, they don't make that many new movies on Easter, you know, for life of Jesus, they, with, uh, they, they show the same ones, but I remember being quite young and watching those black and white movies on the life of Jesus, and they were very long, yeah? they're three, four hours sometimes, and being in tears, honestly, when he was speaking of love and being drawn to that image of uh, this guy who said to the world, you know, I came because of the love of my father for you. I was like, oh my gosh, it's uh, so beautiful, you know. I don't know about your girlfriend and girlf girlfriend, uh, go boyfriends or girlfriends. For me, none of them have told me something like this, right? <laughs> so just to say that that love 
you know, it's being pulled. And we know there's a pure love somewhere. And think of a person or character in history that has that love for all. It's very rare. You know, they become big heroes. I mean, they, they have their photos everywhere in the world. How many pictures of Jesus are in the world? It's too bad they didn't have selfie at the time or, you know, iPhone. <laughs> at least we would have the same picture everywhere and the right one. But I've seen black Jesus, yellow Jesus, you know, depending on the culture of the individual. So uh, these characters have embodied love for millions of people. Why? Probably because they were, you know, holding the power of love. It was not just a virtue, they had the power of love. That's why we remember them. That's why we, we have that connection. We have those uh, seniors uh, teacher here. And I met them all, those three ladies. Now one is 102, the other one is probably 10 years old, I think. She changed body. And the third one is 90. And when I think of them, the only thing I can think of is love. Because that's what they are holding. The power they have is the power of love. So let's think about it, reassessing what is in each one's heart today. And before we go into relationships and purest love, just to take time to appreciate what is love. And to recognize that, yes, in our life, most of the experiences we had of love were physical, which is not bad, it's just that it was physical. Some are more interpersonal, human, grandmothers and friends and others, and they're good too. But how much did we open the door to a spiritual love? You know, before we went to spiritual, some of us had those mystical love. That's what I call fantasy love as well. Oh, love for angels. It's nice. They don't show up too often, but when we think of them, they're very nice. Love for nature. Some have love for food. Some have love not for God, but for their dog, you know, which is nice. I had a lot of love for my cats and dogs. I still remember where one of our dogs is buried. And I still remember holding that dog when I was younger and seeing that dog as such a precious, of course, being. There's love for animals, love for nature, love for humans, but love for life, love for the self. Is the love for yourself physical? Usually it's not that kind of physical. How do I love myself? So the nature of love, if we can really try to reflect on it a little bit and open the door to say, do I want to experience a higher form of love? And if so, then it starts with looking at myself as a spiritual being and recognizing that I, as a spiritual being, I don't eat putin and puddings, but I eat love. I need love. I live out of love. I live with happiness. I live with peace. These are my, this is my nutrition. This is my food. This is what I, as a spiritual being, generate and consume. This is my cycle within. And if I'm lacking these three ingredients, I become a little bit dysfunctional, a little bit dry, a little bit edgy, a little bit delicate. Someone says something to me, oh, I don't like it. You, I don't love you. Actually, I may have actually even misunderstood what the person told me. I may have not understood the reason why that person told me this. I start disliking, rejecting, judging, hating. I'm dysfunctional. I'm a soul without love. I'm a soul without happiness. I'm a soul certainly without peace. So regenerating those pure elements of life, I think we can ask ourselves a question. How long can we continue to live without increasing a little bit more? those three ingredients. And if we just focus on love, can we sit quietly now and just start to say, how about I open the tap of love with 
no charming prince, no more queen of hearts, no more heroes, just me and life and maybe God or higher beings, whatever. But just now, can I regenerate love just by focusing on who I am? Do you think it's possible? Do we all believe that love is really just a frequency of the soul? That's how I like to describe it sometimes. It's just a frequency of the soul. We remembered somebody earlier, an hour ago. That person wasn't in a room, but we felt love. So we, can, we just need to know the start button. <laughs> and if we find a start button for love, we experience love. And instead of having always grandmother start button, child start button, dog start button, just what about the start button, I, the soul? And just pressing the button of who I am as a soul and realizing that if I think of myself as a soul, it means automatically I, the soul, am connecting with love, happiness and peace. This is my natural connection. We can argue also it's connected to light. Sometimes when physically you want to visualize the soul, and that's why we have this painting behind. It's just light. I, the soul, light in the forehead, light and love. So it's just an appetizer. It's just meant to be opening the door to redefining love a little bit. I know you've heard all this. You know all that. You hold it already. You read it in many languages and many words. But the idea is just to trigger again the reflection for oneself. And I'd like to invite you for the next seven days until next week to do a little bit of uh, sorting out of love in your soul. And really spend the idea, that, or use the idea that what if for the next three weeks, not just tonight and next two Fridays, but for three weeks, we do a reevaluation of love in our life and use those three sessions uh, not to learn so much because I think we all know all this, but to just do the work and do the practice of nurturing love in a proper way for three weeks. And for this first week, we'll just not pay attention to relationship, don't think of anyone, don't think of God, nothing. Just to pay attention to um, my experience of spiritual love. Where does it fit in, in me? Where does spiritual love come in? If I say physical love, you know right away who to connect with. Go into your address book, and there's a few <laughs> who will give you that love. That's physical. But if I say spiritual love, how can I, and that's what we'll experience now in meditation, how can I experience love just on a spiritual level because of that spiritual identity? So that will be our first week. Next week after that, we'll spend a whole week going back to cleaning all our relationship. That will be fun. But that's next week, okay? So now we'll just clean up the whole concept what is love, how is love, and experiencing it, and making that love spiritual, and feel how much suddenly you have a bottle of pure love, saying, I like that one, this is good, that's what I wanted, pure spiritual love, and feel how much it opens the heart. And next week we'll add words, forgiveness, compassion, you know, these kind of big words that come with it a little bit. For now we'll just say pure love, pure bottle, free, this is a gift for the week available to all Rajuga centers near you. <laughs> no limit per person. You can claim as much as you want. <laughs> so so let's sit quietly. I know there was an option of having you share, but I thought we'll just slide into that experience and meditate for next five, ten minutes together. So very naturally we relax the body physically <coughs> and we can concentrate all our energy in the center of the forehead. I invite you to keep your eyes open so it feels natural, 
and we don't shift into a mode of sleep or dream. Just like with the eyes normally open. Nothing to fix in particular, just being aware that we're here together. We see the room, the people with us. But even if our eyes are open, we can visualize different images on the screen of the mind. So let's imagine that in the center of the forehead there is light, beautiful point of light shining like a star. The light of the soul. And as much as I can see my body, I can see my legs, my arms, my hands. I know there are expressions on my face. I've seen the light in the eyes. I've seen the smile on my face. But now I want to see the brightness of my forehead. It's not a physical light. It's just an expression of the soul, the spirit, the invisible me, the eternal me. It is like the sparkle of life that brings life even to the physical body. It is the light of consciousness. It is an eternal light It was never created, cannot be destroyed. And it is me. It is I, the soul. That exists. It is I, the soul. That create thoughts, feelings, Awareness. And it is also I, the soul, that have a personality. I'm unique. Two souls cannot be identical. Each soul is unique. I am me. I am light. And if I see myself as a soul, I feel a pool the very core qualities of the soul. What do I want? I realize that being in a physical body is just a way to experience life And this life was to give me love, peace, happiness. But it has also become confusion, 
difficulties and pain. So I want to return to the source. I want to return to the original qualities of the soul. That pure love. That pure peace. and a true happiness because I know that this is what I, the soul is looking for so I want to find that love which is spiritual which is true that love which is natural and I can see the value of love it's the most precious experience of life It brings life within life. It brings beauty in beauty. It brings greatness. But I can hold on to that light, to that love, to that greatness within myself. I see love as my original virtue, the virtue of the soul. And I can see how that love gives me power, strength. They say that love can move mountains. Yes, love gives power. There is no labor with love. Love makes everything easy. Love opens the door. Unlocked the locks. breaks the walls, open the horizon, love is power, and a powerful soul has love, and that love doesn't stop, doesn't end, it is a love that becomes constant. It is always there in my eyes, in my hands. I give love and I can give love to all. And love has the power to heal, to change painful memories, feelings of being hurt. I can heal myself with love. So love is life, and life is love.
So, how is your heart? <laughs> how much love do you have for love? So, is it a deal? This week we all pay attention to the state of our heart and uh, have a heart check. See what uh, the cardiologist will say. <laughs> the spiritual, how do you say in English? Cardiolog? Cardiologist? The cardiologist will evaluate your heart and will see our result by next, uh, the end of the week. <laughs> Don't worry, there's miracles happen for every heart. So I wish you a good week and we'll continue the story next Friday. Thank you for being here. If there's any questions or comments, you can. I'm here. So good night, everyone. Mm-hmm. <laughs>